right, let's uh, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is uh, David Brown, and again, we'd like to thank you for participating in today's Technion's The Greatness of Tableau webinar series. This is our third in that series, and we're super excited to have you with us today. Uh, today's topic is going to be on Tableau tips and tricks, and we have two presenters today. We have uh, Tableau two-time Zen Master and Social Ambassador Josh Milligan. And we also have Tableau Social Ambassador Bridget Cogley joining us today as a co-presenter. Now we're going to do something just a little bit different today. If you see a tip or a trick that you like during uh, today's webinar, if sometime during the day you will tweet that out with the hashtag, hashtag TechneonTips, at the end of the day we're going to select one tweet that will receive a free signed copy of Josh Milligan's book, Learning Tableau. So again, if you, if you see something you really like, if you'll tweet that out, hashtag TechneonTips, uh, we'll get a, a free book out to a, uh, a winner. At the end also, we're going to have a Q&A session. So for those that would like to, please stay on. And uh, Bridget and Joshua will be uh, answering questions from the, uh, from the group today. Let me go ahead and briefly introduce Technion to you. Technion is a 17-year-old BI consultancy. We're located down here in Dallas, Texas. So whatever part of the country that you're listening from today, howdy to you. Uh, we have a number of different service offerings. Uh, we do BI strategy and leadership. We do data integration, visualization and analytics. We do products and skills training in and around Tableau and Wearscape and Alteryx. And we also do custom application development. That's actually the foundation of the company's beginning. Uh, we feel like we have some tremendous technology partners. We're partners with Tableau with Wearscape and with Alteryx, and we feel like the combination of these technologies give us just an incredibly agile approach to business intelligence in the marketplace. Let me go ahead and introduce our speakers today. Uh, Josh Milligan, many of you know and are familiar with. He's been uh, over 10 years here with Technion as a technology consultant. He is a two-time Tableau Zen Master. Uh, just to toot the horn, there's only 21 Zen Masters in the world, and Josh is one of them. He's also designated a Tableau Social Ambassador, which means he invests a lot of time in the Tableau community, simply helping people understand and appreciate and utilize Tableau. He's also the author of a book called Learning Tableau that is available on Amazon. Now, Bridget Cogley just joined Technion team recently. Uh, Bridget came from kind of a unique background. She is an American sign language interpreter that has uh, turned into an analyst. Her background includes training, management, HR, sales support, and data analysis. Now, if you follow Bridget, you'll know that she is a passionate and active blogger and also was designated as a Tableau Social Ambassador, which means she gives back and serves the community uh, frequently as well. So I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to Joshua at this point. Thank you for attending today. Is I'm going to focus a lot on sharing tips and tricks when it comes to data and how how you can uh, explore and analyze that data. So we'll be talking a lot about uh, about uh, those kinds of tips and tricks. And then uh, Bridget's going to come on and she's going to show you how to take that analysis to the next level and make it beautiful and present uh, uh, engaging stories. So I'm going to open up Tableau and I'm going to connect to a data set. Uh, my data set's actually on SQL Server, so I'll go ahead and, uh, and get that started. And it's in a, a database and a table uh, that is related to visits to the hospital, so not always the most exciting uh, topic, but we'll see what the data has to say. Uh, now I always like to look at a, a preview of the data just to get an idea of, of what's here, and uh, depending on your data connection, that, that, that may be possible or not, but, uh, but I like to just sort of scroll through the columns, and I see I've got a lot of things about patient and uh, uh, some other, other things here, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll go ahead and go to the sheet, and we'll start our analysis here. So I've got this data set ready to go, and the first tip that I would like to share with you is... Uh, this field here, the number of records field, uh, I'm going to start with that. Uh, and the very first thing I want to do is I want to understand what this number is. So if I look at, uh, at the number of records, uh, I see that uh, this data source, I've got about 110,000 records. And the first question I'm going to ask myself is, I've got 110,000 what? 
That is, what is a single record in this data set? Is it a patient? Is it, uh, is it something else? Uh, and and either, either I'm going to know the answer or I'm going to find out, I'm going to ask uh, the, uh, the IT team, or I'm going to use Tableau uh, to discover the answer for myself. And uh, to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to just flip this view here, and I'm going to start to slice that number of records until I figure out, uh, figure out what it is. So I'll just take some dimensions, and uh, if I look at admit type, I see I've got, you know, elective and emergency, uh, different, different types of admissions. But it's obviously uh, not one record per admit type. I've got uh, you know, multiple records for each one of those. So I'm going to go through, and I might think, uh, let's check patient, just to see if there's one record per patient. Uh, there is not. So if I look at patient ID, I've got some patients who have four records or 11 records. I might even sort this just to get a better idea. And in fact, I've got uh, one patient that has 75 records in here, another patient that has 65, and, uh, and so on. So I continue searching. Uh, next, I see visit ID. So I, identity fields are, are good candidates uh, for this. And when I look at visit ID, uh, I see that this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for one record only, and I'm going to sort just to make sure. But even sorted, uh, it, it's still one record uh, per visit. So now I, I am comfortable that with this data source that I feel like I've got one record per visit, and that's going to help me a lot as I start to do my analysis. That's going to help me understand what I'm working with. It's going to help me when I write calculations. Uh, and it's going to help me with the assumptions that I might make. So in fact, I'm going to take this number of records field and I'm going to rename it just so I even know what it is. Uh, here's another tip. Just click and hold on that field in the data pane for a couple of seconds and I can rename it right there. So number of visits. And uh, so yeah, I've got one, one visit is one record. And now I can start to look at what kind of analysis I can do with number of visits. So now I might go through and uh, again, admit type. So now I know what I'm looking at. I'm looking at, uh, at 70,000 elective uh, visits, uh, about 600 term pregnancy visits, uh, and so on. And I might do that with a few other, uh, other dimensions here. So I might look at uh, you know, patient gender. And uh, that's interesting. That's the number of visits for female patients, male patients, uh, apparently, we have a few patients that their gender was unknown or uh, or can't be determined in the data, at least. Uh, I've got some other dimensions, marital status. Uh, so that could be interesting to look at. Uh, payment option. So I look at this and I think, okay, yeah, so here are the visits of patients and, and how they paid for that visit. Uh, so all, all kinds of different uh, payment options. Uh, primary location. Let's take a look at that one. Uh, okay, so this is interesting. Things like ER and labs and uh, some patient rooms, operating rooms. Uh, and then one that uh, this outpatient other. So apparently we've got a lot of outpatient uh, visits and, and maybe they're just not assigned a location. If, if I exclude those, now I get a little bit better view of the data and I can sort by visits. So so this gives me a little bit of a view uh, into the data. And, and now I'm starting to feel pretty comfortable with the data set. I, I understand what, you know, what an individual record is. I understand what dimensions I have to work with. Uh, but as I look at the, at the measures that I have available for my analysis, I've only got this number of visits. In fact, there are no other measures uh, in the data itself, um, at least not explicitly. So, I could do some analysis with this, but as I think about what I might want to understand uh, about a patient visit or, or a hospital operation, I'm going to be looking for ways to, uh, to create some additional measures. Uh, as I look at the fields, I see that I've got some dates, and those are good candidates for, for understanding some things, especially here is a patient birth date. And uh, one thing that I know that I can do with a birth date is I can calculate the patient age. So if I right-click that and say create a calculated field, uh, I'll give it a name, patient age. And uh, then I'm just going to write a, a calculation here. So date diff, 
Uh, we'll do it in years. Uh, one tip to, to think about is that if I do it in years, that's, uh, that's not very precise. Uh, if I want to be more precise, I might calculate it in days and then, and then do the division of, of 365. Um, uh, but but I'll, I'll be content with the years. And then so I have a start date, which is the, when they were born, to the end date, which uh, I might start with the idea of using today. And by the by way, another quick tip here, I can hold down control and use the mouse wheel to uh, change the size of the font. So if I'm, if I'm presenting this, I can make it a little bit easier to read. Um, so when they were born to today. Now that is technically the patient age, but another tip to think about with, uh, with calculations is what kind of analysis uh, is going to be really helpful. Um, their age is going to change over time, obviously, but uh, what I may really want to understand is how old were they when they were admitted? So instead of today, I have date of admission over here. And so I'll drag and drop that and we'll just replace uh, today with date of admission. So now this is not just patient age, this is patient age at admission. And I'll say OK. And that gives me a new measure uh, that I can work with. Now, age is an interesting kind of concept because uh, it is a measure in some sense. I could do like the average age. Uh, summing up everybody's ages is not too useful. So in some ways, it's, it's a dimension. And uh, one thing that I like to do with age is just to create a, uh, a histogram. Uh, the easiest way in Tableau is just to select the field and then use show me and uh, click on histogram. And Tableau creates a nice histogram of age. But I, I, I definitely want to encourage you to use show me, but to use it uh, with an understanding of what Tableau is doing uh, when you use it. So always look at what fields Tableau brings into a view and why they do what they do and, and are they really what you want. Uh, so on columns, it's used this patient age at admission bin, which I look and it actually created this bin field. So I might uh, right click and edit that bin. And I noticed that Tableau just took its best guess. I mean, there's some logic behind it in terms of the size of the bin, but that's not very uh, intuitive uh, for me to think about uh, 6.9 year buckets. Uh, 10, 10 year buckets, that's a little bit easier to wrap my head around. Uh, so what decade of, of life are my patients in? Are they in their teens, 20s, 30s, so on? Uh, that's a little bit easier to understand. And then I need to look at the other field here. So it has given me a count of patient age at admission. And all that's doing is that's just counting every time that the patient age isn't null. So really that's the same as my number of visits. In fact, if I drag number of visits up here to rows, I see the view doesn't change at all, just, just the label of the axis. Uh, that may be what I want to analyze, but this is where understanding what the data is and understanding that, uh, that it's one record per visit, uh, that allows me to understand that if I want the number of patients, I need to do something like account distinct of patient ID. So I'm going to take that patient ID field, and here's another quick tip. Uh, just right click, so holding down on the right mouse button instead of the left mouse button, or I think the option key if you're on a Mac. Uh, drag and drop that with the right mouse button, and when I drop it, Tableau asks me, how do I want to use that field in the view? Uh, I want account distinctive patient ID, so I'll select that option. And uh, you might have noticed a little bit of a change uh, here. The bar has changed a little bit. Uh, but the biggest change is the, uh, the axis and the scale of the axis. So notice now we're looking at about 11,000 patients at most. Uh, if I undo briefly, notice when we go back to number of visits, the scale was up to 22,000. So definitely a different type of analysis when I look at the number of patients instead of the number of visits. Uh, now, this count distinctive patient ID, that may be something that I use over and over again, uh, so I can create a calculated field for that. So right click, say create calculated field, and uh, I just may want that number of patients as a calculation that I can use over and over again. Uh, another quick tip, just grab a field in the view if you already have it, drag it and drop it right into the calculation editor, and I've already got my count distinctive patient ID.
say OK. And now I've got number of patients right there. I can, uh, I can drag and drop and replace that. No change except for the label there. Now, at some point in my analysis, you know, I could go through and, and look at number of patients. I've got that as a measure now. I've got the patient age. I've got number of visits. Uh, there are other other calculations. I could I could look at some of these time time uh, values, date and time. So I've got arrival, admission, discharge. So I could look at maybe the difference in time from arrival to admission. How long does it take to admit patients? Uh, how long from admission to discharge? So what's the length of stay? There are all kinds of measures hidden in this data that, uh, that I can find. And, uh, and I could look at that and analyze it and try to understand it. At some point, I'm going to find a story or I'm going to find something in the data that I really want to pursue, that I really want to understand. In this case, the one thing that, uh, that stood out to me was the fact that I've got this location. Uh, in fact, I've got a location and I've got a floor. So let's just look at the uh, number of patients uh, by location. And uh, I'm going to take out those outpatient uh, group again. I'm going to exclude those. And in fact, I'm going to exclude those uh, just everywhere in the data. So notice on a filter I can apply to worksheets and I can say everything using this data source. Or I could apply it to, to individual worksheets. But, but now we're going to keep those outpatient uh, patients uh, away. And we'll just look at the location here. And, and a bar chart is a great way to look at things. I can see the ER has more patients uh, overall uh, than, than anything else. Operating rooms are pretty full. Uh, but then everything else is kind of a mix. Uh, so bar charts are a great way to see things. I could look at this several other different ways. But when it comes to locations, uh, what I may really want to understand is where are these things physically located? And are there patterns that I can determine by looking at their actual location? Uh, now, I do have the floor here, so I could look at that, and I could see that you know some things are downstairs, some things are upstairs. Uh, but again, it's, uh, it's helpful to see it this way, but are there other ways that I could see this data? And the answer is yes. In fact, if I, if I go to hospital administration and ask them, uh, they may be able to provide me with floor plans for the hospital. So I can actually uh, get these floor plans, and I can see, okay, there's the downstairs layout, there's the upstairs layout. And uh, one thing that I know in Tableau is that I can, uh, I can actually bring in images and use them as a background and plot the data on those images. Uh, the thing that always is a little bit frustrating to me is figuring out how to do that. So, so I came up with a way that, uh, that works that allows me to do it fairly quickly. Uh, and my thought was, why don't I just, uh, why don't I just take, uh, see if there's a, an online tool? So I just said, well, how can I plot coordinates, coordinates on an image online? Uh, and the very first result here was a website uh, that does that. It allows me to upload a picture. Uh, an image and uh, and click on it and get those coordinates. So lots of explanation, but the key here is I'm going to just choose my file. I'll get uh, I'll get the hospital downstairs. We'll start with that. Uh, prove to it that I am a human being, and upload the image. And then very quickly, I can just uh, just click right where I want that data to show up. And as I do that, it's building out my coordinate system down here. So I'll do that, that, and that, and then come down here. I could edit it all, but I'll just finalize it. And there are some coordinates for my downstairs locations. I'll just select, copy those, uh, get Notepad, and uh, paste those. So I'm going to create a data source here of locations. Um, I've got my X, my Y, and uh, what I'm going to add is I'm going to add the room so that I know which, uh, which room it is. So this is my downstairs. I've got, uh, got room one, room two, lab one, room three, room four, room five, lab two, x-ray, and ER. All right, and I could do the same thing with uh, with the upstairs rooms, but for the sake of time, I'll just uh, 
I'll just grab and copy and paste those from when I did it earlier. So now I've got my upstairs, my downstairs all together in one data source. And I'm ready to go back to Tableau. So I'm just going to take this data, and here's a tip. Copy, Control-C, and back in Tableau, Control-V to paste. Very quick and easy way to get tab data into Tableau. I can just paste it right in, and you'll see it's got this clipboard data source, uh, which I can rename if I want to, uh, just to help me remember what this is. So this is room locations. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use this in a blended kind of way. Now, when Tableau 10 comes out, maybe I could even do a cross-database join, but blending will work just fine here. Uh, and I'll just double-check that, that I can blend between these two data sources. So I'll switch here to hospital visits and I get my primary location, just drag and drop there. And I notice that there is nothing here uh, for me to blend on. Uh, so I could go in and edit the data relationships like it said, but the other the other thing I can do is just if I make sure that the fields I want to blend on have the same name. So again, click and hold. We'll call this one room. And there's Tableau already linking on those fields and giving me the blend that I want. Now what I'm going to do, I'm going to switch to a new sheet, and I, I want to use my, uh, my hospital visits as the primary data source. And I want to be able to get the X and Y coordinates from the, the secondary data source. Uh, but I'm going to actually need those X and Y as fields here in my primary. So real quick, I'll create some calculated fields, uh, X. So I did that with hospital visits selected, but then I can switch to room locations and just grab that X and move it in. Um, instead of sum, I'm going to use something like min or, or max or average just to make sure that I'm not adding up all the X location, all the X values or, or anything like that. Say OK. And do the same thing here. So there's my X field, but we'll create a new calculated field, Y. Grab that Y field from my secondary source. Call this one min or max or average. And say OK. Now I've got my X and Y in the hospital visits data source. And what I'm ready to do now is add an image to the data source. Or in this case, a couple of images. So under map on the menu, background images. I have to select which data source I want the image to apply to. I do want it to apply to this hospital visits data source and we'll add an image. Here I get to browse for the image itself and what I know is that, uh, let's see I've got hospital one and two, this is downstairs and upstairs so I'll start with, uh, with hospital one and uh, here I can see the dimensions at 797 by 708 so so I plotted the coordinates as the x, y, but I need to know how big the image is itself. So 797 wide, 708 tall. The trick here is making sure that I have the field that I want. So x matches up to this, and it was uh, 797 wide. So we start at 0 on the left and go to 797 on the right. Y. Uh, with an image, we actually start with zero on the top and then and then go down to the bottom. So here it was uh, 705. And uh, since this is the uh, downstairs, I'm going to switch to options and say only show this when my primary location floor is downstairs. So that's the only time that that, that image gets shown. Say OK. I'll add one more image here. We'll do the same thing. So hospital two, which is upstairs. Just double check the dimensions here, 795 by 708. So we'll take that one. Again, X maps to that, 797 to the right. Y starting at the top at zero and going down to 708 on the bottom. And on the options, I'll say only show that when the primary location floor is upstairs. And I think I'm okay. I'm going to say okay. We'll see if this works. Say okay again. And now I'm ready to show the image. And the image will show when I use X and Y as scatter plots. So there's my Y uh, giving me a Y axis. Here's my X giving me an X axis. And uh, nothing's showing up, and at first I might uh, be very concerned about that. But remember, uh, it will only show it up, show it based on the floor. So I need to use floor as a filter or some way to slice the data. 
So when I show that floor, now I'm getting my downstairs, my upstairs, and the image is starting to show. Uh, why am I getting only just a little point here and a little point here? Well, it's because now I need to add in the room to make sure that uh, I'm getting the right X and Y. So I'll, I'll even just label the room. And there is my hospital floor plan with everything mapped exactly the way I want it to. I can plot the data now. The only thing that looks a little strange to me is that if I compare that to the, uh, to the original floor plan, I notice it's upside down. Uh, which seems a little bit odd until I remember the Tableau starts its coordinate system down here at 0, 0 in the lower left, down here too. Uh, but images started at the top at 0 and then work their way down. So quick tip, just right-click the axis, say Edit Axis, and on the scale I'm going to reverse it, which makes Tableau match and start at 0 at the top and go down, and now my images work just fine. Uh, I don't need to see the axis, so I'll right-click and, uh, and we'll uncheck Show Header. Do the same thing for the x-axis. That's just to get my images plotted, but not helpful otherwise. And now I'm ready to see how I might want to show this data. So I might want to, uh, to zoom in or out. I can use the mouse wheel, so hold down on Control and use that mouse wheel until I get things to show up the way I want to. I uh, notice these little dotted lines. Those are zero lines. I don't really care to see those. So I right click and say format. And here under lines, the zero lines, I'm going to make those go away. Uh, and uh, close that format out. And uh, let's just look at how many patients we have had in each one of these rooms. So I'm going to drag and drop that maybe on the color. And uh, let's go to uh, square, because we can use the square to kind of fill up the space, make it a little bit bigger. Um, looks okay. I may even want to see the, uh, the number of patients as part of the label. Uh, the only kind of thing that I don't like so far, um, well, I might, uh, might want to play with the colors a little bit and get a nicer, nicer gradient than green, but it's okay for now. But I also noticed this little gray background and border around the, the images. That's actually what Tableau calls a halo. So if I go to color, click on that, notice the option here for halo automatic. If I turn that off, if I say none, now I get nice transparent backgrounds on the text. And, uh, and in fact, uh, let's center that text inside the square. So if I click on label under alignment, I can center that uh, horizontally and vertically. And now it kind of shows up right in there. Maybe make the squares a little bit bigger now. Now that I've got the text in there the way that I want to. And now I can start to see where things are and how they're located. So I notice, uh, you know, the ER definitely has the most. The operating rooms definitely have, have quite a few patients. Uh, but I may want to focus just on, just on the rooms. And so one thing that I can do is, uh, and I always used to be hesitant to do this, but, uh, but now, especially since I know that Tableau 10 is going to, uh, going to play really nicely with groups, I, I don't worry too much about grouping these uh, sorts of things. So I might right-click room and just say create a group. Or I could even do it, do it here in the view. So maybe I just take room 1, 2, 3, 4, and uh, 5 six, and so on. Just take all of these rooms and, uh, and group those. So there's my group option. I'll just group those, just group it on room. And now I've got, uh, got a room group on color. I don't necessarily want to see it on color. I liked having the, uh, the patients on color, but let's rearrange it just a little bit. Take that room up to filters. We'll just look at just the rooms and uh, put the number of patients back on color. And now my gradient uh, shows me some differences in the rooms. And in fact, what I can see is, wow, room one, we don't use that much at all. Um, maybe because it's back there in the corner with a doorway that's, uh, that's far away from everything. Room five, we use that one a lot. Maybe because it's closer to some of the operating rooms or, or labs. Uh, but it allows me to start to understand 
what's going on in the data and to see uh, some of the patterns that I might have missed if I had just used bar charts or, uh, or other standard visualizations. But being able to actually plot that uh, on the image, that brings out a whole other uh, view of the data and a whole other story so that I can understand. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Bridget, and she's going to show you how you can take the analysis uh, to the next level and really make things pop as you, uh, as you tell the story uh, and you get ready to present to others. So, Bridget. Well, thank you very much, you Joshua. I truly appreciate it. And so I'm going to go ahead and jump right in. And so first I just want to start with a real quick high level. Um, just as a reminder, this will be available. And then I kind of want to start with a little bit of inspiration. So one of my heroes in life is Giorgio Moroder. He invented both disco and EDM. And so one of the things he said is once you want to free your mind about a concept of harmony and music being correct, you can do whatever you want. So nobody told me what to do, and there was no preconception of what to do. And to me, that really represents a mindset that goes well with Tableau. And so you look at Tableau and the openness that you can do, and as Joshua demonstrated, just by asking questions, not going in with a preconceived notion of what you should find, you're able to really find much better things. Um, I'm also going to very quickly look at some calculations that also help power some of these visualizations, and also just briefly touch on colors and icons. And actually, I'm going to go ahead and just very quickly take a quick detour and just kind of show you some of the icons I'm using. I did pull these from a place called the Noun Project. And what I did is these are all actually the same color, but using PowerPoint, I did drop a few of them down in transparency. So it's a really cool, useful technique. Feel free to use PowerPoint, throw your icons in there, make them color match your, your, your templates. And then that way you can go forward and really make some nice, powerful visualizations. Um, again, as David mentioned, my background is American Sign Language Interpreting, so therefore I really, really love to use icons. A couple other things, as we saw with Joshua, we, he really did a lot of exploration just looking at the data. To me, it's a bit like speed dating, but for dashboards, so you really get to know your data very intimately. Another thing is just once you're done wrapping up your dashboard and really making sure that you play nice with others, the last thing you want to do is put together a really nice dashboard, hand it off, and then the next person looks at this and goes, that's great, but I don't know how to work it. And you're getting phone call after phone call, or much worse, the dashboard gets abandoned. So one final thing, don't forget to tweet Technion Tips. I definitely want you guys to get that book. It is phenomenal. So I hate to have you guys miss out on that. So as we saw with Joshua, I'm actually going to go ahead and start very quickly with a chart. And so for me, you, this is a very typical chart that we'll sometimes do, where we just look at things and try to figure out, okay, what's going on? And so the problem I'm looking at today is shipping. And so what I want to do is just really understand what's going on with my store and shipping. And so for me, the first thing I want to do is say, okay, well, if I'm looking at shipping, I'm going to start out with some calculations and just figure out how do I best look at shipping. So the first thing I'll do, obviously, is say, well, how long does it take to ship a package? And so very quickly, I'll just put together a calculation very much like Joshua did kind of a date difference of calculation. But the next thing I'll do is say, well, there's a risk that I may want to aggregate this and compare this. So, Because to me, when I look at shipping, one thing I'm also going to look at is customer experience. Are my customers being served? So I may want to actually roll this up by customer. So in general, what is a customer's experience with shipping? Are they having a good shipping experience or not a good shipping experience? So, and I'll go delve deeper into these a bit later, but I do have a level of detail calculation. And what this allows me to do is, for my Excel users, you're very familiar with pivot tables, and this is kind of like a pivot table within a large Excel report. I can make these mini sources or mini tables in different areas and roll up the data to the level that I need so that I can do the comparison that I need. So another calculation I did is also by mode, and this is actually one calculation I use a lot. And so I've got ship mode, which is basically how fast did it get there, and how long did it take to get there. So I'm going to do a lot of analysis on this particular metric. And you'll notice that I do have fixed, and I also have an include statement later on. And again, I'll get to this in a little bit, but before I go too deep down the, the level of detail rabbit hole, I just want to show you where I've made some of these calculations to just begin looking at shipping. But the other thing I have is I have some of these standard calculations that are kind of my go-to. 
Now, if I look at this chart, it's very hard to really get any patterns. It's hard to see what's going on. I'm trying to figure out from my customers who's having a good experience and who's having a bad experience. So I've created this variance calculation, and I'm just saying who takes longer, who takes shorter. So it's right now difficult for me to see. I bring over index, which I know just allows me to set. This is a, a table calculation. I can set this by customer name. And you see that it creates an index by customer name for each row, each row being determined by the actual dimension or by the actual measure. So I've got up to 500 or 600 different rows. Well, that's a lot, and that doesn't necessarily help me. I end up kind of with the same problem. So what I want to do is change this up a little bit. So I actually have another calculation called scatter. Now, this is not an actual calculation. Um, it's index, but index on steroids. So what I do is I take index, so I've got my standard index calculation, but then I put a modulus behind it, and then I choose a random number. And by random, I definitely mean random. I could put 42, but I actually ended up liking this shape the best. So if I go ahead and set compute using by customer name, you can begin to see that this makes a bit more sense. You can see the shape that it makes with the data, and I've got some understanding of what's going on. Now you'll notice I am using folders, and this is a great way to carry over calculations. So I have my standard calcs, and so these are some of the calculations I know I use a lot. So of course I copy them over. Other things are like shipping, and then I have customer-centric calculations, and then I have some advanced ones that I'll go over later of just what I need and why. So these are great ways to organize, and you'll see that Tableau itself also provides them, and I've got a few that I've added in there as well. So the, the thing that you've been waiting for is not so much my chart, but my, my dashboard. So I'll let you kind of take a moment just to get a feel for what's going on here. So for me, I wanted to look at this from a state level. Is there variance within the state? Are there certain states where we don't perform as well? And so that was the first kind of slice of this data that I wanted to look at. So the first thing I did was I said, okay, well, I want to look at this from a state level. I want to see kind of average days by state. So I can see Maine, pretty much nobody is ordering anything in Express. So nobody's in a hurry in Maine. Everybody can wait. However, if I look at North Dakota, North Dakota is in a rush, which surprises me. But nonetheless, I can kind of get a feel for what's going on. Now, if I click on this, it does filter the entire view, so I can begin to start understanding what's going on with the data and get a feel for everything going on. Now, one thing you'll notice is that this map does look a bit different, and that is very intentional. One of the things I wanted to do was keep the focus on the state and not anything else. Now, typically, when we have a map, it's got all sorts of things. We've got Canada. I've got to pick on Canada a little bit, Mexico, and a lot of the other places out there. And we've got oceans. Sometimes we have labels. We have a lot going on. So what I wanted to do was just cut that out, put the focus on the state, and then format it to match my dashboard. And so you can see that that is what I did. So you can see I've got the paint selected, I've got the worksheet selected, so that this background fills in very nicely. Moving on from that, I needed to do a lot of analysis around, well, variation from average. Well, average of what? So I'm going to go ahead and I'm, gonna, I'm really going to peek inside. And this is where I had mentioned I've got that level of detail calculation. Now, what is a level of detail calculation? It's one way for me to hold the data at a certain level. And so what I wanted to do was look at the shipping, and I wanted to look at the shipping by a particular level. So for me, mode is important. Mode is basically, did they order it express? Did they order it, you know, two-day delivery? Because to me, that matters. So I want to get an average of each and then look at that. So you can see that's my calculation. I said look at ship mode. So should look at ship mode and then calculate the average. And so that's what this is doing. And so you can see, when I look at it this way, I get a better feel for what's going on. And I can tell that, for example, in Montana, things are taking a long time. And there's a lot of variance. So some people are looking at, you know, and there's a lot of variance not because, you know, some people are ordering express and some people are ordering five day. It's that there's a lot of variance within those. So that gives me an idea. Well, what happens if I change that to include? So if I change that to include, you can actually see there's a lot more variance. You can see that the data itself changed. I'm going to toggle through this just a couple more times so you can see that shift. So you can see I've got a big drop with North Dakota. And when I change it to include, that drops. 
And so you can just see Iowa actually becomes first versus when I leave it fixed, Montana. So that gives us an understanding of kind of what this looks like. Now with include, I'm actually including the state. So it's slicing by both the state and by, by the, um, the mode as well. So that's where I didn't necessarily want that because I am looking at this from an overall standpoint. So going back to this, this is kind of my view. We saw how I made this chart. Um, so moving on from this, I want to look deeper into my customers and understand, well, what's going on with my customers? And so if I look at this dashboard, you can see I'm really taking a deep dive into my customers. I've got ways to filter them so I can see why I only want to look at customers ordering a certain way, just so I understand what's going on with them. Now, you'll notice I've got some dark dots in here, and that's because my manager also wanted to say, well, is it because of holidays that we're getting some slowdowns? Is it because, you know, they're ordering a couple days before Christmas, and that's why everything's taking longer? And I think we can see it's a pretty resounding no. Um, holidays seem to be faster for some reason. Maybe everybody's in a rush to get out for the holiday. I know we've got one coming up. So therefore, maybe everyone's just trying to get everything out and ready first. So I can kind of take a look at that. Now, how does one do that? There's a couple different ways. And I'll be very frank, my background is not necessarily SQL. So I have very you know, sharp limitations. So I need to do this in Tableau. Ideally, I would do this type of calculation in SQL. But unfortunately, I just don't have the ability to, whether it's I need to go through IT or I need to do this on my own. So therefore, what I've done is I've made this in Tableau. Now this is extremely complex, and so because it's extremely complex, I've actually broken this up into five pieces. The last thing I want to do is just <clears throat> sit there and write a ton of code. So I wanted to break this into pieces that I could trace. A couple other limitations with LOD is that it requires a dimension. You cannot put a calculation on the left side. So I kind of compare this to the force. If you look at the force, it bends mine. So if you put a weak mine too close to that, it's going to bend. So therefore, everything must be on the right if it's going to be calculated. So I can take a look at this. This is just a custom date part. And I can see, OK, I've got a date part month here. Um, Joshua Milligan has some great posts just about how to do dates and dates and custom dates. So I won't delve too deep into that. But then the other thing I need to do, if I'm going to start looking at holidays, I know I have some holidays that occur on the first Monday, some holidays that occur on the first Thursday, or just there's a lot of rules around holidays. So I need to identify the first of the month so that way I can start saying, well, what week within in the month is it? So I need to be able to, on my calendar, be able to label one through, say, five on the weeks because I need to know that certain things are a third week or a fourth week. So I've created another calculation, again, very similar, date add, and then set it up so that I can trace my, my first date. And if I actually do a quick describe, this is another great tip, I can kind of get a feel for what do those dates look like. So now I can see, OK, everything is a 1. Next, I know I have this horrible complication called Thanksgiving. And Thanksgiving has to make it difficult because it's on Thursday. So what I did is I said, OK, well, I'm going to find Thursday. So Thursday in my calendar, because I'm starting with Sunday as the first of the week, is 5. And then, because my weeks don't all fall on the particular day, so every month doesn't start on Monday, sometimes the month starts on Friday, I've got to be able to move my week numbers. So I can say, this one falls on the first week, or this one actually falls on the second week, but it's the first Thursday. So that's what this calculation is doing. Um, just to call attention to this, to make sure that people can follow my logic, I have used comments. So just a double slash kind of lightens up the text. And then you can sit here and write a novel, if you wish, of how you've done things so that people can follow your logic. And then I apologize. This is probably going to scare a lot of people away. Um, again, I mentioned I didn't code, but maybe I lied. So. This kind of looks like some of the C++ programs I saw back in the day. But again, you've got an if statement. And then I call out each holiday. So that way, I can track and those who are following me can track. But not only do I track, say, here's the holiday, I make a note of the business rule because I'll be very frank. Um, despite my mother working for Hallmark, I'm very, very bad with holidays. <laughs> and so 
I needed to, for me, know which of the days that this holiday fell on. And so I went through, wrote down the logic, and you'll see what I've got to call these, these holidays that move around the calendar are dates-based. That's when I start using a fixed LOD. And then I start looking for max dates within that particular section, and you'll see that I've got this heavily commented so that the next person who takes this on can understand what it is I'm doing. It's, it's a very nice practice, so that way you don't make enemies. And so I definitely try to make friends wherever I can. And again, you can see Labor Day, I've done something similar. If this date is actually equal to this specific, if this date falls within this realm of, you know, third Monday. So that's where I can kind of start tracking this down. And you can see from there, I use that particular field to call out my holiday. Now, why didn't I just type in the dates? Because this is fully automated. So now I don't depend on going back in and manually updating this report. It's another great way to make friends and not have people throw things at you. So that is kind of my real quick overview of how to build the holiday. And then lastly, sometimes I want to give my users control, but I also want to limit what they do. So I do have a parameter here. And again, this is a fairly standard parameter. You can see where I've actually got kind of the sort by, and I also just reference, and I've got kind of my measure values here, and then I flip through my sorted metric. So if I go into advanced, because I'm using my folders, um, I'm trying to keep this very organized for the next person. You can see I just do a simple rank unique, and I've got my sort by. If I hover over this, another quick tip. You can cheat and actually look at the calculation in this window. So not only does it contain your quick calculations, but you can also look at calculations you've created. So I'm just saying, if the parameter equals profit, then pull up profit as a sum. Otherwise, just average out the days to ship. So this is my quick dashboard to just understand what's going on with my customers and get insight into what's going on with them. And that is my quick overview. And I will turn this back over to David. Hey, Bridget, fantastic. Thank you so very much for that, and Joshua, to you as well. Um, hope that everyone here today heard something that you can apply in your organization to help uh, people better see and understand uh, data. And in reality, uh, great users like Joshua and Bridget uh, give us phenomenal uh, hints and, and tips and tricks on, on better using Tableau. But many times we do face organizational challenges, and, and Technion as a, as a Tableau Gold partner may be uniquely positioned to assist you with maybe Tableau services. Maybe you're getting started with Tableau and you're in a need of best practices consulting or maybe training, whether it's formalized or maybe it's custom training around Joshua's book, Learning Tableau. Or maybe you need assistance in dashboard development. Maybe you're looking at some of the dashboards that Josh and Bridget have built and you're thinking, mine may not look quite like that yet. And we offer all kinds of assistance as it relates to uh, helping you create dynamic and interactive dashboards to tell the story of data. Uh, maybe it's around Tableau Server. Maybe it's publishing content to your organization. Maybe it's setting up server. Maybe it's upgrades or performance tuning. Or maybe you're having a lot of success with Tableau on a small scale and you're thinking, okay, what am I going to do to take this organization wide? And we can assist you with the Tableau Drive methodology to do that. Or maybe the issue isn't Tableau. Maybe the visualizations are fantastic but you don't really trust the data you're looking at, or maybe you don't have access to all the data you need. And so from a data solutions perspective, we can assist you in building data warehouses using data warehouse automation, a tool called Wearscape. We can also help you in blending multiple data sources. I think we're all dealing with more data sources than we've ever dealt with before. And so using tools like Alteryx and even Tableau, we can assist you with that. And then finally, maybe you're just thinking in the BI maturity model, how do I get my organization from here to there? And maybe you're just in need of developing a data strategy or a BI roadmap. And we can absolutely assist you with that. So regardless of the need, we would love the opportunity to serve you and serve your organization. Thank you again for everyone attending today's webinar. Just a reminder, don't forget that the uh, tweeting will take place throughout the day. If you'll take one of the tips and tricks that you heard, if you'll tweet that out to uh, hashtag TechneonTips, uh, we'll draw a winner at the end of the day and send you a free copy of Josh Milligan's book that will be signed. And right now we're going to go ahead and kick off a uh, Q&A session. We realize that we're running up against the, uh, 
the end of it. For those that can stay, please uh, hang on, and uh, Josh and Bridget are going to answer your questions. So thanks so much, everybody. All right. Yeah, so it looks like we've got several questions that have, uh, that have come through. So uh, one question uh, was, don't data sets come with data dictionaries? And if not, don't you think going back to the business users is a good idea to understand what you were dealing with? Uh, so yeah, and I think that was probably came through when I was talking about you know how I how I like to analyze the data and understand what's really there. Uh, so absolutely, a lot of data sets are going to come with a data dictionary or or be documented so that so that you can know what's there and not not have to guess. Uh, at the same time, there's a lot of data sets that don't, and uh, and so it it'll depend on your situation whether or not you have confidence in the data going into it. Uh, confidence in your understanding of the data, or whether some of that initial analysis is is an exploration of what's really there, um, and that's that's just a judgment call that you'll have to make probably based on your situation. Um, another question, I, Bridget, this may be for you uh, or me. I don't, I don't know, but what's what's your top three tips for a beginner? Uh, Bridget, I'll let you take that one. So I would say the first thing is start with the question. So the best thing that I've done before, especially when I was first starting out, was every dashboard I would literally write the question as the title. So for me, you know, my question on state overview might be what's going on with states. And so everything I do is going to support answering that question. Um, the other thing is don't go into it with the, the notion that you have the answer. Um, I found a lot of insights just by kind of going through and saying, you know, I'm not going to go in here assuming I know the answer. I'm not going to say, oh, I know it's holidays, because as I found, it had nothing to do with holidays. Um, I won't lie, I still don't have the answer on why shipping by customer isn't, you know, always so, isn't very standard, but at least I have better questions. And so, you know, that would be kind of my second tip. Um, as far as my third would just be keep trying, keep learning, and keep asking, participate in the community. I think anybody who's talked to me for a long term, I know I've got a couple of my buddies on this conference, um, and they've heard me say again and again, just go and participate in the community, whether that's user groups or Twitter or anything of that sort. Yeah, no, that's great. And I think I'll, uh, I'll sort of piggyback on, on that final answer, because that, that was what came to my mind first, was, was the, the Tableau community and the data visualization community is amazing. Um, you know, the, the forums uh, that, that Tableau has uh, are a great place to get in there and ask questions or, or answer questions. I, I learned so much just trying to answer uh, people's questions. It's a, it's a good, safe place to answer. Uh, when I got it wrong, uh, people told me, but they were, they were kind and polite. And uh, people like Jonathan Drummy and uh, Sean Walwork uh, would patiently and, and kindly correct my wrong answers, but I learned a lot from that. And uh, you know, Twitter and blogs, there's there's so much out there. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for uh, for attending. I know that uh, the Bridget and I have a lot of fun uh, doing this and talking about this, and uh, so we'll uh, we'll definitely get to some of these questions that we didn't get uh, get answers to and, and clarification. But uh, it's been a pleasure to, to do this, and uh, thank you all for attending.